Hi, everyone. Can everybody hear me okay? Let's see. Um, a little microphone test. Can you hear me? Yes? In the back? Yes? Marvin cannot hear me. Carlos cannot hear me at all. Oh, my God. Um, let's see. Bring this closer. How about now? Kind of. I think this is a brand new classroom with zero power outlets. Um, so hopefully our laptops don't run out of power before the lecture is over. Um, Peter called the classroom services to see if they can fix this projector, but for now it seems like everything will only project on this side. So this is the first lecture for uh, deep unsupervised learning. Um, if you're here for something else, then now is the time to, to go. The instructors for the class, maybe we can actually point everybody out. So I'm Peter Beal, up from here, then Peter Chen. Here, Jonathan, you want to stand up? People can see you, and Arvin in the back. Um, also, that camera is recording, so if you don't want to be recorded, then make sure you're not in the view of that camera. Um, we plan to record a post the recordings of the class, but there's going to be some delay probably because campus has some rules about needing us to get captions before we can post these, which can often take a week um, before that happens. Um, let's see. Schedule for today, we're going to go through some logistics. Then we'll look at motivation, why even study deep unsupervised learning. We'll then actually get started with autoregressive models, and then we'll look at compression, which is one of the main applications of unsupervised learning uh, that we can tie back to everything we're going to be doing this semester. So, syllabus for the semester. I just stepped through what we'll do in week one. Week two, we'll continue with likelihood-based models, uh, including flow models. Week three, latent variable models. Week four, more latent variable models than implicit models, which is GANs, more implicit models over there. Then non-generative representation learning, which is where you learn to predict color or um, where a patch is relative to another patch and so forth. Um, Semi-supervised learning, which is one of the other reasons unsupervised learning can be useful. More representation learning tied into other problems. Spring break week, uh, that's without us. Then Lecture 9, unsupervised distribution alignment, which is learning from corpora that in some sense are related, like two, uh, let's say, corpora in English, one in Spanish, and somehow learn the connection between the two. And then we'll start our guest lectures with Ilya Sutskever, Dirk Kingma, Alec Radford, somewhere in here, Alyosha Efros, whenever he uh, gets around picking a date. Then Aaron Van den Nord, and at the very end, uh, there is final project presentations. Probably if there's still that many people in the class, uh, there will not just be one final project presentation session because it might be a little long to sit through everyone, but we'll figure something out based on however many people are left uh, by the time comes. Let's see. Um, grading logistics. 50% will be homework, 50% final project. Uh, we don't know yet how many homeworks there will be. So don't count on it. Like, don't like skip your first one because there's going to be four other ones. There might only be three. There might be five. It depends on how long it takes us to build these homeworks. Uh, so somewhere between three and five homeworks. Final project, uh, more information forthcoming. Uh, maybe highest order bit is you can do it in teams up to three students. So if you, you know, want to start thinking about who you might want to work with, uh, that's something to figure out maybe sooner rather than later. The goal is to do something researchy or something that is a really cool application. Um, and we'll also be available to brainstorm with you about possible final projects if you're not so sure uh, what project to do. Admission to the course. Um, so it's based on three things. Application on the website. That application is, has been live for a while. I think most of you already filled that out. Um, then... We'll look at your homework one and uh, people who attend class. Um, the timeline for homework one is going to be due on the 11th of February. Um, so hopefully we can tell you a few days after that. This weekend we will um, have some um, classification of the applications. We'll classify you into conditional admit, which means that um, 
if you do a strong homework one, you're in. Uh, and if you attend the class, I guess, but that's, that's quite easy. Then um, you could be on the bubble, meaning, yeah, there's a few more spots beyond the conditional admits, and maybe some conditional admits actually don't do homework one, so they don't make it in. So some people from this batch will make it in. And then a batch where it's extremely unlikely you're going to make it in, and it's good for you to know ahead of time because maybe you, you want to spend your time on something else than homework one. And then some of you will send a, a note saying that you just don't have the right background. Uh, at least based on what you put in the application, because that's all we can know about you. And that, hence, you're also not going to make it into class based on what we know. Any questions about this? Yes? Uh, you guys already kind of send out some of those emails? Yeah, so to, we already send out a bunch of emails for conditional, conditional admits based on information we had three or four weeks ago. So people who applied early might already have received something that tells them they're in this batch. People who applied later might find out this weekend that they're also in this batch or in a different batch. Any other questions? Yes? Are the homeworks to be done individually or is it yourself? Um, homework, you have to do your own homework, but, and it has to be your own work, your own code, but you're allowed to discuss with others as you think about your homework, you just are not allowed to copy anything or take code or take anything from anybody else. But discussion is allowed and encouraged. Any other questions? OK, for communication, we use Piazza, which I think many of you already know from other classes. If you're not on it yet, make sure you're on it, because that will be our main mode of communication. We also have a staff email address that you can use, but we prefer to go through Piazza if possible. It also turns out that some people not from Berkeley fill out the application form to take the Berkeley <laughs> class. Um, but Piazza is supposed to be private to just uh, Berkeley students. Um, but we added everybody who applied into Piazza originally, so now we're going to kick everybody out who in their application did not use a Berkeley EDU address. And so if you are kicked out, contact us, and we can get you back in with your Berkeley address. So we only have people with a berkeley.edu in the class forum. OK, office hours have not converged yet. Um, but mine will be Thursdays, 9 to 10. But for this week, catch me after lecture. And Jonathan, Peter, and Arvind will post their office hours sometime over the weekend for uh, next week. Warning, first offering of the course, so there will be a lot of rough edges. Uh, places where this will manifest itself is, for example, maybe you know, some homework problem is not as solvable as we think it is. Um, and that can happen. And so if, if that's difficult for you to deal with, then be, just maybe take the class next year if we offer it again. Um, but also, let us know. If something seems off, don't be afraid to say, hey, this doesn't work for me. Um, can you take a look, uh, especially for the person solving the homework first, um, that most likely to encounter any kind of funny things. OK, that's it for logistics. Any other questions about logistics? Yes? Sorry, say it again. Um, we, we hope the class will be smaller in the future, and then uh, we'll be more easily able to keep track of it. Um, <laughs> right now, it's not so clear. Okay. Um, so we just posted the draft slides on the Piazza. So if you want to follow along, like, you can download from Piazza. Great. Did everybody hear that, though? The announcement was that the draft slides are available on Piazza now. So if you want to follow along with the slides on your own laptop, then um, you can look at them. Okay. So motivation. Why even study unsupervised learning? Well. Hey, oh, are you going to fix our projector? Nice.
Okay. You can continue teaching. Okay, so why unsupervised learning? Um, well, it's maybe the simplest way to think of it is that supervised learning works really, really well, but it's very tedious in annotating data. And so the, the notion why you'd like unsupervised learning is because you don't want to do all the work of annotating your data or pay the price for it. Similarly for reinforcement learning. Um, when you learn from sparse rewards, that's nice because you don't have to supervise much, but learning is very, very slow. And so the hope would be that maybe through this unsupervised learning thing, you can learn from data that nobody had to annotate or from maybe experiences that nobody had to provide rewards for. So there's two general no kind of approaches to unsupervised learning. One is called generative models-based unsupervised learning, where we look at generating a probability distribution that models the data. Other type of unsupervised learning is what often is called self-supervised learning, where um, essentially puzzles are being created that require semantic understanding of, let's say, images. Like, is this patch below or above this other patch? Or how would you color this patch? And there it's essentially still very much a labeled uh, training task, but the label is somehow come up with in a very clever way that does not require human labor. So, why to do this? Well, here's one quote from uh, Jeff Hinton. The brain has about 10 to the 14 synapses, and if we only live for about 10 to the 9 seconds, um, then so we have a lot more parameters than data. This <laughs> motivates the idea that we must do a lot of unsupervised learning since the perceptual input, including proprioception, is the only place we can get 10 to the 5 dimensions of constraint per second. So essentially... 10 to 14 over 10 to the 9, 10 to the 5, that's how many um, constraints we want to get per second to be learning at full capacity of our brain. So that's one possible reason. Quoting one of the other pioneers in the field, Jan LeCun. Jan gave a keynote at NeurIPS in 2016, introducing or presenting this notion of the cake representing how learning works. The cherry on the cake is reinforcement learning. Um, it's the thing that does not provide a lot of signals, so small volume. Um, then the icing of the cake is supervised learning. has a medium amount of signal because you still need to annotate, which is time-consuming. And then the main mass of the cake is unsupervised learning, where you have most of the signal. And so his call to action in that talk was essentially, if we really want to make serious progress on AI, we have to make progress on unsupervised learning because that's where the real data is much more than anywhere else. So let's see what we can do um, with that. Another motivation for unsupervised learning is that intelligence is all about compression, finding patterns. There's a few lines of thoughts or paradigms within this. Um, finding all the patterns corresponds to essentially finding a short description of the raw data. Kolmogorov of complexity is um, essentially a notion of complexity where you say, what is the smallest computer program that can uh, generate this data? And the smaller the computer program, the better you have compressed that data. And so finding that program is a unsupervised learning task. Solomonov induction is finding the shortest code length um, to be able to inferences that you see in your data. And AI, XAI is essentially the same idea, but applied to reinforcement learning. And so the overall idea here is that you try to find the shortest possible explanation of all the data you have seen so far and continue to try to do this as you get new data. Aside from theoretical interests, you might care about unsupervised learning because it can allow you to generate new data, and we'll see some examples soon. It might allow you to compress if you need to store a lot of data. Compressing that data is very helpful, or you need to transmit a lot of data. It's good to be able to compress. You might be able to improve performance on downstream tasks, and it might be a flexible building block that you can reuse as a component in other problems. Here are some examples of early successes of unsupervised learning. This is a deep belief network generated set of images. Um, this is an approach we're actually not going to cover in detail, but one of the early approaches um, that has fallen out of favor today. Um, but essentially what you see here going from left to right is a progression of Gibbs sampling in a probabilistic model. And as it progresses from left to right, sampling has run for longer, and you see how it converges onto a sharper and sharper incarnation of a digit in its class. Variational autoencoders from 2013. Um, doing a little better and definitely computationally a lot more efficient. GANs, generative adversarial networks, 
allowed to generate images that um, look somewhat realistic, maybe not in the very first paper just yet, but it was a lot of signs of life already there. Um, then the paper that kind of made it very visibly uh, capable of generating realistic images was the DCGAN paper in 2015. This is all automatically generated bedroom images, automatically generated face images with the same uh, approach, same paper. And you want to try something else? Um, no, they're sending over the staff because they actually have to open up the black box. Okay. So he'll be here in like 10 minutes. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Let's say you have an image all the way on the left that is um, originally giving a, given to you as low resolution. You could use standard interpolation to then get a higher resolution image. That's what you get on the left. You could train a neural network to be a super resolution network with a squared error on the pixels. That's the second image. You could train it with a GAN style approach, which of course we'll cover in detail later. Um, that's the third image, which is essentially attuned to the human perceptual loss more than the squared error is. And then all the way on the right is the original that was downsampled to start this whole process. Here's another example. Um, this would fall under the kind of self-supervised learning uh, type learning here. The video on the left is the original. The video on the right is automatically generated. And um, you can turn any video of, zebras, of, of horses into zebras or the other way around. Oh, that was very fast. OK. Then, very recent result, Big Gan um, from Andrew Brock and collaborators showed that it's possible to generate extremely realistic, high resolution images. And in fact, that the latent space interpolations um, are, that the latent space interpolations are most of the time resulting in pretty meaningful images being generated along the way. which in turn might make you hope that that latent space could be useful for doing other things in the future, maybe learning to classify images or something else. As calibration, how many of you have seen this? <laughs> Any big N results? 80%? Then recently, out of NVIDIA, it was um, shown possible to generate very high resolution face images. And actually, if you look at the representation that they use underneath, there is a certain decoupling of style that they have, allowing you to um, have more control over style than was possible before. Audio, let's see if we can actually get this to play. Um, So, anybody hearing anything? No? I'm not hearing it. Okay. Five second delay. Yes. It's like, <laughs> like national public broadcast in case <laughs> we say something unacceptable. Um, this is going to be a different version. It's not meant to be this different. <laughs> Okay, not sure how to make this work, but um, maybe let's just play it loudly from laptop speakers, see what happens. Um. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. So this the one Blue here. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. Automatically generated with WaveNet. 
in comparison more traditional the parametric is a approaches. American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. So if you listen carefully, when using WaveNet trained on a lot of samples of human voice, you get much more realistic intonation in how the sentence is pronounced compared to standard parametric voice generation like you would also have in your GPS typically. Here are some videos that are all automatically generated. In fact, with the types of models we will cover today. And here's some text automatically generated also with the types of models we will be covering today. So we have here Ella's, I think he shall become approached and the day when little strain would be attained into being never fed and who is but a chain and subjects of his death, I should not sleep. Okay, second senator and so forth. This is from 2015. Um, not unreasonable. Um, then you can do the same thing for LaTeX and generate, uh, I guess, papers and homework solutions. Well, <laughs> attempted homework solutions. <laughs> now, one way to measure the results, and we'll see more about that today, is how much compression you get. So a good model of the data should be able to predict very well what's coming next, and then should need very few bits to encode what's next, and we'll see more about that soon. And so when we measure here for images, the number of bits needed per dimension, so red could be a dimension, green, then blue, and then red, green, blue of the next pixel, and so forth. Number of bits per dimension, PNG uses almost six bits per dimension, WebP and other standard, 4.61. But then the, and this was after many, many years of thinking about how to do compression, the learning-based approaches are able to get down to half the number of bits needed to compress the same image and achieve the same quality. Of course, you can do even better if you're willing to do lossy compression and lose some reconstruction capability. Here's another example. Um, the picture on the right is compressed with something called Wave 1. Um, this is a neural net-based compression approach. On the left, the original JPEG, well, a JPEG image in the middle, JPEG 2000. And each three of those get the same number of bits to transmit across a channel. And these are the three different levels of reconstruction that you can get. Wave 1 is actually a startup, started out of, um, well, one of the founders is Lubomir Burdev, who was a PhD student here at Berkeley until a few years ago, and just started a company around using unsupervised learning uh, for compression. Here's another example of what's possible with unsupervised learning. Here, a neural net was trained on a very large amount of text uh, to learn to generate the next character in the text. Then, after it's done that for a very long time, an inspection was done of the recurrent neural network doing this, and a neuron was identified that correlates really well with sentiment of whatever text is currently being generated, and that neuron is being highlighted as the neural network is now processing the text. And so we see that initially the text is highlighted in green because it reads something very positive about a great book. And then it turns red because it turns out the movie made around that book is pretty bad. And it starts realizing that. One of the main use cases people tend to envision when doing unsupervised learning is train on a lot of unsupervised data and then hopefully be able to quickly train on something else in the future where there is a small amount of labeled data, where normally you couldn't do very well based on just the labeled data, but then with the small amount of labeled data in combination with a lot of unsupervised data, uh, you're able to do well. Um, natural language processing has been a lot of progress on this, with especially the recent uh, BERT paper out of Google. Essentially, what we see here is that this is tested on a wide range of tasks, which we'll get back to in lecture 10, um, where pre-training is just learning a language model and then, after the fact, can solve multiple benchmarks reasonably well. Then, in computer vision, similar. Um, here's a listing of a range of self-supervised and unsupervised learning or generative model learning techniques that lead to then better performance on classification tasks, detection tasks, and segmentation tasks even though there was not a lot of supervised data, largely relying on the unsupervised learning 
to start to get representations of what's in an image and then fine tuning based on a small amount of supervised data. I think that's it for me for now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Want to see is there any questions uh, as we switch over? I see. <laughs> There's still a classroom recording happening somewhere, so still be careful what you say. Um, any any questions? Oh, nice. Oh. Thank you. Do you want to use my laptop? Oh, question there? Yeah, so the question is, do GANs, generative adversarial networks, really generate new images, or is it mostly memorization? Um, it's a little tricky to evaluate when the data set you train from is really large, but in principle, you can investigate this by doing a nearest neighbor search. So whenever it generates an image, you can see if you can find a close-by image, and if ever you cannot find any close-by images, you could see, oh, well, maybe this one is new. It's a little tricky because how do you measure closeness? If you measure it in a pixel space, it might not be the best metric. So in practice, it's not that easy to do. Um, I would say the bigger challenge is probably to make sure they generate enough variation in images um, rather than zoning in on specific types of images. So another answer to that question is if you um, look at the big GAN video, so what was shown there is you take a couple vector in your latent space, and then you interpolate between them. And then you basically see like what are all the samples that you get in your latent space. And if you get like smooth interpolation between them, then most likely they are not just memorizing. Because like if they you designate one chunk of your latent space to be one data example and then another chunk to be another example, then you should see sudden jump, as opposed to a smooth interpolation between two seemingly possible images. Everybody hear me? No. <laughs> Great. That's that's what I want. Okay. Hey everyone. I'm Jonathan. Um, okay. okay. So I'm going to talk about uh, some more detail about autoregressive models. Uh, this is the first class, the the first family of deep generative models that we're going to be covering in this class. We cover this first because it's, they're relatively easy to train compared to all the other models that you'll see um, in, in this field. Um, and it's also very connected to stuff that you probably know from an introductory AI course. And it's uh, also very, I guess, conceptually simple and can probably be tied into what you might know from statistics classes as well. OK, so I guess I'll give you more motivation. Um, and then I'll talk about some very simple generative models. Um, and you may have seen these types of generative models that I'm going to talk about, but I will emphasize how they failed drastically in high dimensions. And that will motivate the, de the design and use of the, m the more modern neural net-based autoregressive models uh, that are so popular right now. OK. So you saw in uh, Peter's introductory slides that there are a bunch of problems that, real world problems that we would like to be able to solve. Um, let's say uh, you would like to type in some text into a computer and you wanted to paint a picture of, uh, of the scene that you just described. So that's an image synthesis problem that, is, that can and is being solved by autoregressive models and other generative models. Um, you could synthesize videos. Maybe in the future uh, we could 
I don't know, write a movie script and dump it into a computer and out comes the movie. Uh, you don't need to hire anybody anymore. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, you could generate fake news. That, that would be amazing. <laughs> uh, we, we could generate uh, speeches of, you know, maybe instead of me giving this lecture, I could have just typed this up last night and uh, you, you could have just listened to me. Um, or generating text. So a very common example of text generation is machine translation. This is a generative modeling problem where you give a network an input sentence and you ask it to generate an output sentence in a different language. So that will use the same machinery of autoregressive models that we'll discuss here. Um, so these are all very nice practical problems. Another nice practical problem is data compression. Um, so it turns out that data compression is very related to likelihood-based modeling. Or, uh, and we'll talk about this later on in this lecture quite a bit. Um, the reason is the reason data compression is related to generative modeling is because generative modeling is all about prediction. Yes. Louder. Okay. Hello. Okay. Maximum. Yes. Cool. Um, where was I? Okay, yeah, compression. So compressing data is all about constructing efficient codes. What that means is, let's say you have some really large object, like a movie. It's like 10 gigabytes on your computer, and you want to represent it in, uh, in a smaller file, like one gigabyte. That's what compression is. And it turns out that compressing well is all about generative modeling. And the reason this is the case is because generative modeling is about prediction. And the better you can predict something, the less data you, you have to transmit. So for example, if you can predict every single word that I'm about to say, um, then, well, you don't need to write down anything I'm going to say. In other words, you, you, you don't have to store any information. Um, on the other hand, if you can't predict anything about what I'm going to say, um, then you have to store everything. So since generative modeling is about predicting well, you can see that this is about compressing well as well. Um, there's also the problem of anomaly detection. So say you see some massive data set of natural images in the world, um, and you want to uh, filter out, say on your website, for uh, images submitted by users which are hand-drawn. Well, those, you can tell that an image is hand-drawn just by looking at it. And the reason you can tell is because you know that it's somehow out of the distribution of natural images. Like the colors are different, the, the shapes of edges are, are different, and so on. Um, it can be quite difficult to write a program to do that automatically, but if you have a likelihood-based model, then you can actually do this. OK, so I should say what a likelihood-based model actually is. I think that would help. So the, a likelihood-based model is a model which is a distribution, a joint distribution over data. That's all it is. So the setup we have here is that you're given a data set of these points, x1 through xn, sampled IID from the true data distribution. So to give you a picture of what this means, imagine P sub data is ImageNet. And to sample data IID from ImageNet means to, I don't know, pick, pick images randomly from ImageNet. Maybe the better, more general version of this is to imagine P data to be the space or to be the distribution of all natural images. And then you can imagine that this data set is ImageNet itself. It's some finite empirical you know, it's an empirical distribution, some empirical realization of this, of this data distribution. And so a likelihood-based model takes this data, and it wants to estimate the distribution itself. Okay, what does this actually mean? What is a distribution? So for the purposes of this class, a distribution is a function that takes in a data point, like an image, or like one concrete image, or one concrete movie, or one concrete sound file, and it spits out a number between 0 and 1, which is its probability. Um, and that probability is supposed to be the probability that it was actually generated by the true data generating process. Yes? So does the probability have naturally to be like between 0 and 1? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. So everything that 
we'll be uh, talking about today is about discrete data. Um, the next lecture will be about continuous data. Cool. You guys are listening. Um, okay, so this is the goal. Um, and, well, we could do this, um, but we want this to be useful for downstream tasks, right? We want it to be useful for synthesizing new, new data. We want it to be useful for actual compression in the real world. We want it to be useful for feature extraction, for downstream RL tasks, or whatever you like. Um, so what does that mean? Um, in practice, we want this P that we recover. So this P will be the model that we learn using, using whatever procedure that we define. Um, we want that to satisfy some properties. We want to be able to compute P of X for arbitrary X quickly. So given an X, you should be able to plug it into the model, and it should tell you the probability that it occurred, or the log probability. Um, and you can use this, say, for anomaly detection. So if you plug in a data point, and the, and the model tells you that the, the probability is extremely small, extremely close to zero, then there's a, assuming your model was fit well, then it's probably not in the data distribution. Um, we also want to be able to sample from the model. Um, it turns out that this is really tricky to do well, but it's very important because that's what enables us to have all these practical uses. Um, so sampling, I hope you guys know what sampling is. So sampling means uh, there should be some process, some, some computable, efficient process that generates a random variable x, and the distribution of that random variable is the same as the distribution of your model. The, the distributions match. Okay, yes. And again, everything that we'll be talking about today is about discrete data. Okay, that's a likelihood-based model. Do you guys have questions? Okay, cool. All right, so people have known how to learn, estimate the parameters of likelihood-based models for a very long time. Uh, there's an entire field called statistics that does this all the time. And so what, what is, why is this class different? Why, why are these methods that we're dealing with particularly different from the classical stuff? Well, it's because we're concerned with high-dimensional data. This is the key thing that sets apart the methods that we'll talk about versus the classical methods. So imagine, imagine we want to learn the distribution of 128 by 128 by 3 images. So this is, this is an image. Uh, this means the height of the image is 128 pixels. The width is 128 pixels. has three channels. Um, so that's, if you like look at that on your computer screen, that's like kind of small. It's not going to take up your entire computer screen. But if you count up the number of dimensions of this data, it's like 50,000. This is massive by the standards of classical methods. Um, and and we'll, see, we'll see explicitly how some very naive methods for training generative models will fail in this setting, fail really badly. Um, and what we do is uh, deal with it. We, we try to come up with algorithms that can deal with dimensions that are this large. So... Part of the challenge, you know, they, this is a very hard problem. And so there are going to be a lot of challenges in designing models that work with distributions over high dimensional data. Um, and there will be a lot of possible algorithms that you can dream up to try to solve this problem. And if you try to design such algorithms, you'll realize that there are a lot of, there, there are seemingly a lot of trade offs. I don't think we totally understand which trade offs must happen and which just seem to be hard today. But these trade offs do seem to, crop up when you try to design these models by hand. Um, so we want the model to be trained, trainable quickly. Right? You, you don't want the training procedure to take exponential time or anything like that. And we want the model to fit on the computer. It shouldn't take exponential space to fit the model. Um, we want the model to be expressive. In other words, it should be able to fit, actually fit the data distributions we care about. Um, yet we want it to be able to generalize so it shouldn't take as many data points as there are possible, possible data points um, in order for you to get probability estimates at new data points. Um, and 
So the, these are kind of like, you know, computational and statistical requirements that we want. Um, there's also the practical ones, the practical computational ones, um, and, and the ones about, uh, you know, usefulness in downstream tasks. So we want samples to be good. Uh, sometimes you might find that if, if you have these properties, samples won't be good anymore. That actually happens in real life. Um, and we want the speed of all, all, the, all the procedures that we want to run on the model, uh, we, we want that to be good as well. So sometimes sampling might be really slow for models that compress well. Um, and yeah, more, more trade-offs like this. Okay. So to set the stage for fancy autoregressive models, um, I'm going to talk about the worst possible generative model that you can ever think of. And it's this. So recall again that the, the goal of generative modeling is to, well, you're, there's some data distribution. You see it. You, you have a view into it through a finite set of samples, x1 through xn. And you want to figure out what the data distribution is. OK. So now suppose the samples take on values in a finite set. This is a discrete random variable. So the values are 1 through k. OK. So if you know that the values are 1 through k, and say k is something reasonable, like 10, um, what's, what's a model for this? Well, I guess it's already on the board. Uh, but a model is for this is just a histogram. Right? So remember that a, a likelihood-based generative model is a function that takes in a data point, and it spits out the probability. So the possible inputs, the, the domain of this function is this set 1 through k. And the range of this you know, is, is real numbers. So you might as well just describe this function with k real numbers. Right? OK. So this is a histogram. Um, I'll, I'll try to dry, draw this on the board. OK. So we have this, that samples take on values in 1 through k. And so the model is this is a collection the model is a collection of probabilities p1 through pk okay this this is a likelihood based generative model these k numbers okay does does everybody see why this fits into the definition of a likelihood based generative model yes cool OK. Um, can somebody tell, tell me how to fit this model? What? 1 over k. So that does not depend on the data. <laughs> so we, we need a scheme that looks at the data set, right? It's quite important. So let's say the data set is x1 through xk, or xn, and these are all elements of 1 through k. So the way to do this is to form a histogram of the data. This is the way to, to fit these types of distributions. Right? So you, the data set is going to be some collection of numbers, like 1, 5, k minus 1, k, 2, so on. This is the data set. And so what you do to fit the model is you draw a plot like this, where on the x-axis you have 1, 2, and so on, up till k. And you just count up the frequencies inside the data set. So maybe like there were two occurrences of 1 inside the data set. And if the data set is size 10, then that's like 20%. Right? So this, is, this bar is like 0.2, and so on. You can just go on and construct such, such a bar graph, a histogram. OK, so histograms are likelihood-based generative models. OK. And that's what it says here. The, the way you compute p sub i is you just com count the number of times p sub i, or the number of times i appeared in the data set. And you divide by the number of points in the data set. OK. So recall that we want 
some things out of likelihood-based generative models. Uh, we want them to be useful, right? We want to be able to sample from them, and we want to be able to evaluate the probabilities. So if I give you an arbitrary x, or in other words, some i, some number between 1 and k, you should be able to tell me, you should be able to query the model for the probability that that happened. So can you do that? Yes, it's very easy to do. You just return p sub i, where i, or p sub x. Right? This is just an array of numbers stored inside your computer. Um, what about sampling? That's the other application of generative models that gave us those cool results that we saw. So can you sample from this model? I guess you could plug it into NumPy or something, and it will sample for, for you. But I think it's important to know how the sampling actually works. So the way to sample from a histogram is to sample a uniform random number between 0 and 1 and plug it into the inverse cumulative distribution function for the histogram. Have you guys seen this before? This is like a standard way of sampling uh, sampling from distributions, right? You, or univariate distributions. So should I describe it? No? OK. So that, that's how you sample. This is the procedure if you wish to implement it. OK. So this is great. Now we have a likelihood-based generative model uh, that we know how to fit with a very simple procedure and that we can sample from and that we can make these prob probability queries with. So are we done? Is, is this like the best model that we, can ever, that we can ever make? You can probably guess that the answer is no. And it's because of the curse of dimensionality. So as I said before, what sets the problems apart, this, the problems we study in this class ap apart from the more classical problems is that we, we're concerned with high dimensional data. So there's this data set that you've, you guys have probably seen called MNIST. It's a data set of digits, handwritten digits. So MNIST digits are these 28 by 28 images. They're very small. They're really tiny. Um, and let's say in the binary case, each pixel has value 0 or 1. So how many images are there? Well, there are 2 to the 784 possible images. This is a huge number. So what if you tried fitting a histogram on MNIST? You can, you can, this is perfectly well defined. It's not a good idea. And why isn't it a good idea? It's because this k here is 2 to the 784, which is an astronomically large number. Um, you would never be able to store that on your computer. Um, and even if you could store it on your computer, there's a crucial problem, which is that the size of the MNIST data set is 60,000 images. That's far smaller than 2 to the 784. So you'll never get any idea of, of what the distribution should look like outside of the data set. In fact, you can, just by looking at this definition, you can already tell what the resulting fitted generative model will be. Right? If, you, if you took a generative model where k is 2 to the 784, and you fit this on MNIST, does anybody know what the resulting fitted generative model will be? Like the resulting histogram. Yes? It will, um, it should be like, is it one over two to seven eighty four for the digits that are in the data set? Or like the exact value? Of the right. Zero or right, exactly. So the answer is that the, the probabilities corresponding to, dat to digits present in the data set will be one over two to the seven eighty four, and the rest will be zero. In other words, the model is just the data set. Yeah. Yes, yes. One over the data set size. Yes. One over 60,000. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so in other words, the data set, uh, the model is the data set, right? It's the same thing. Uh, sampling from the model will just give you an image from the data set. So that's really poor generalization. OK. And the reason this happens is, you know, first of all, there are way more parameters than there are images in the data set. 
But that by itself is not so much of a problem. The reason that is a problem is because each image in the data set influences only one parameter. This is the crucial issue. Um, because there is the model is defined so that each possible data point has its own parameter, if you were to update this model by showing it any one image, no other parameters can be influenced. And that's why only 60,000 parameters will be non-zero um, out of the 2 to the 784. OK, and so the way we deal with this is the following. What we do is instead of treating the P1 through PK as parameters, we, we instead define them to be functions um, of other parameters. And every data point, every data point's probability uh, will be a function of theta. And we will define this mapping so that whenever we update theta for any one particular data point, it's very likely to in influence P sub K or P sub I for other data points that are similar to the one that we just updated. So this idea is called function approximation. So here, we, we want something like the dimension of, of the space that theta comes from should be much less than K should be much less than the number of possible images. So this way, the, the parameter space, theta, is indexing into this low-dimensional space inside the set of all probability distributions. And that's how we get generalization. This is called function approximation, and it's a pretty important idea. OK. Cool. So to be, to restate what I just said. Um, in function approximation, what you do is, instead of representing each probability separately, uh, you define a mapping from a parameter space to a space of probability distributions. That's called P sub theta. Um, to be concrete, theta will be, say, weights of a neural network. And P sub theta will be some architecture, some neural network architecture with those weights set as constant. And then you can query it for uh, probabilities of some given data point. OK, so that's called designing a model. And we're going to do that. That's, that's what people in deep learning and statistics do all the time, design models. Um, and, and so the problem now becomes find theta, which is the, the parameter vector indexing into the distribution space, so that you approximately get the data distribution. So now this is the new learning goal, the new goal for learning likelihood-based models. Um, so to just unpack this sentence, there's actually quite a lot going on here. So there's this approximate equal sign. So what does that even mean? What does it mean for one distribution to be kind of equal to another? Um, and how do we exactly define this piece of theta? Um, we will want to define it so that however we measure the difference between these two distributions, we can optimize theta or find a better theta to make these more equal to each other. So we need to dis design some kind of distance function between distributions, which is differentiable with respect to theta. And it works on finite data sets. Um, so you can see that there are a lot of these choices that have to meet, be made. Like, what is, how do you measure distance? Um, and how do you ensure that this is compatible with, say, the hardware you have, and say, the data set sizes you have? Um, and kind of one point that I think we'll see throughout this course is that all these decisions need to be made at the same time. You, you have to design everything together. Um, this isn't sort of, uh, I think maybe uh, before in machine learning, people really like to separate optimization from, say, like function class design or feature design. That really doesn't work here. You, you have to design everything at the same time. Um, and uh, that's what makes it so tricky and, and fun to work on. OK, so exa how exactly will this work? Uh, so I, I think at the risk of being pedantic, the way we find theta so that P sub theta is approximately equal to the data distribution is by designing a loss function, which is a function of theta, and the data. That rhymes. Uh, and we would like to uh, minimize this using uh, a tr 
an algorithm that we can run in practice, like gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent. Um, and there are some properties that we want this thing to satisfy. So we want this to work with very large data sets, like millions of training examples, like ImageNet. Um, trust me, it's actually very easy to write down an algorithm that doesn't work on a large data set, um, like that one. Um, and we want this algorithm to work. What does that mean? That means that after you run it, the, the piece of theta that you get out matches the data distribution. So that means we have to somehow define this distance between data distri between distributions. Um, and one thing that we have to keep in mind is that is what we actually want. What we actually want is that piece of theta matches the data distribution, but the loss function can only see the data distribution through a finite set of samples. So this is this is really tricky, um, and this is because well, in practice you only see finite data sets. You only see a training set. So in other words, you have to worry about generalization. Um, you want the, the entire data distribution to match for all x, yet you can only see some samples. So that's, that's why this is tricky. OK. So there was this very nice tool given to us by statisticians a, a long time ago called maximum likelihood. And maximum likelihood is exactly this loss function that satisfies this. Um, so you, you probably could have seen this coming because that, the histogram fitting, is maximum likelihood. Um, but the reason we use maximum likelihood as opposed to other ways of measuring distances between distributions and other procedures, like, I don't know, method of moments, is because this works in practice. This, this is the only reason. Um, I, I want to emphasize that. Like, the only fundamental reason that we care about, at least in this class, is that this stuff works in practice. And that's why we use this. And we'll talk about why this works in practice. OK, so one reason this works in practice is because, well, one reason why we think it works in practice is because if you really do have enough data, and if the model class is large enough, in other words, some theta really does uh, lead p sub theta to match the data distribution, um, then this works. This will actually find you a model, as long as you give it enough data. So that's known. Um, Another reason this might be a good idea is, um, we'll talk about this later on in compression, is that the maximum likelihood objective exactly measures how good of a compressor the model is. So this might not make very much sense if you, if you haven't seen these ideas, uh, but th this is the KL divergence between the empirical data distribution and the model distribution. Um, and this is exactly measuring how redundant or how bad this compressor is. OK, so as I said before, the reason we use maximum likelihood is because it works. So what does that actually mean? That means that it leads to an algorithm that we can run in practice that actually gives us good models. So what does it mean for the model to be runnable in practice? Well, keep in mind we're working with large data sets. So this model must be able to, say, process the data set, or this training procedure must be able to work with the data set in a streaming fashion. And it does, because the maximum likelihood objective is an average. Um, and we have this wonderful algorithm called stochastic gradient descent, which is explicitly designed to minimize averages. So I, we're, we're assuming in this class that you know what this algorithm is. Uh, so just set up notation. Um, stochastic gradient descent is an, algor is an optimization algorithm that uses uh, gradient access, just first order access to the function. Um, and it, it will minimize some objective function f with some noise in it. You can plug in theta and there's some noise in it, but it'll, it'll, it'll average out that noise. It'll minimize, compute the optimal theta with that noise averaged out. And uh, this exactly fits the framework, or maximum likelihood fits this framework. So in maximum likelihood, uh, the noise comes from sampling from the data set. Um, if you imagine in practice running stochastic gradient descent in TensorFlow or something, that randomness is you looping over the data set, picking random mini batches. Um, so this fits. And again, why do we do this? It's because it works in practice. OK, so that's the, that's the training algorithm and sort of the distance metric that we'll use between probability distributions. Um, so. 
th this is all great, but it would not be useful if we were not able to design models that fit into this framework. So what we'll do and what you'll do in homework assignments is actually design neural networks that fit into this maximum likelihood plus stochastic gradient descent framework. So what are the key properties or is there a key property that is necessary? Um, there is. This key property is that your neural network um, is able to efficiently compute the log probability, the, the model log probability for a given data point from the data set. So th this is not always easy. So you will have to design your neural network so that this is true. And you will also need to efficiently compute its gradient. So I, actually, I guess for optimization, you only need the gradient. Um, but you probably want the log probability to, to like evaluate your loss. OK. So that's the property we want. Um, and we're going to be using, as you probably guessed, deep neural networks to define these models. Um, I think the reason is pretty clear. We want to work with high dimensions. We want to work with complex data. There's really no other practical choice that we have at this moment. Um, OK. So it will turn out that it's kind of hard to design these, uh, to de design these models, actually. Um, you might imagine, OK, how do you design a neural net that takes in a, a number uh, data point x and uh, spits out a probability, a parameterized function that does this. Well, you might be like, OK, let me take x, flatten it into a vector, and like apply some linear layers, throw in some like relus or whatever, and it gives you a number, right? Is that good enough? So that's not going to work, because probability distributions must, must sum to 1, right? OK, so this, this equation looks really, I think it looks very benign, right? You just, you just want it to sum over 1, to sum up to 1. But it's actually very hard to deal with. And the reason is, again, due to the old enemy of the curse of dimensionality. So the number of terms in this sum is the number of possible data points, right? The number of terms in this sum is exponential in the dimension. So it's that, that's why it's hard to design a neural net that has this property, right? If, I think if you were to be naive about it, even computing a forward pass in the neural net would take exponential time. So that's why this is tricky to do. Th this constraint here is relatively easy to deal with. You just like clip some activations or something. Okay, but, but this, is, this, is, this is really hard to deal with. This actually seems... As you'll see later on in the course, this actually seems like a fundamental problem of why distributions are hard to, to approximate and parameterize. There are other models called energy-based models that do not have this constraint inside the model definition itself, but then you as, but then you're forced to deal with that constraint in the training algorithm, and that makes the training algorithm really, really uh, hard to deal with. So somehow this 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 is always hard to deal with, and you'll always have to deal with it when you're working with probability distributions. OK, how do we do this? So I actually just copied this straight from the CS188 slides. Um, the way you do this, the way you construct a, a neural net uh, with the property that if you loop over all possible inputs and you sum the outputs, you get one, uh, the way you do that is as a base net. Uh, so a base net is this. Um, I'll just talk about it very briefly. Here's some five random variables. A base net is a model family um, defined so that the joint probability distribution, the joint model probability, um, decomposes as a product over each variable, which is like the conditional probability of that variable given its parents. And the point of this is that instead of representing the entire joint distribution with numbers, you just have to represent the conditional probabilities. And this can give you a massive savings in the number of parameters needed to represent a joint distribution. Um, so why does this make sense with neural nets? Um, it's because we know how to design neural nets, which condition on a lot of stuff and predict one single small variable. Uh, so for example, an image classifier What's an image classifier? It takes in an image. It's very high dimensional. It's a lot of stuff. And it predicts a single label from 1 to 100. So we, we know how to design models of that form. And those we can plug in to be the conditional probability distributions.
Okay. So again, this would be useless if it were not compatible with maximum likelihood. But it is. How nice. Um, it's compatible because by definition of the base net, the model joint probability decomposes like this. Right? And now let's ask, what did we need for the, for the, um, for maximum likelihood training? We need the gradient of this guy. We need the gradient of the joint probability. Um, so you can see that all you have to do is sum up the gradients of the conditional probabilities. Right? So it's, it's easy to do. And it's tractable. Now the first question you always ask when introducing constraints on a model design like this is, is it expressive enough? Do you lose anything? Can you still represent all distributions? And the answer, fortunately, is yes. And the reason is that any distribution, P, can be decomposed like this. Um, so I will draw a base net just to show you. OK, so here's, here's some random variables. In practice, we will have way more than four. Uh, but the point is that no matter what the joint distribution is, you can always represent it as a product of conditional distributions in this form. OK, does everybody see what I've done here? What I've done here is I've taken the, the variables, x1 through x4, and I picked an ordering. I used 1, 2, 3, 4 for that ordering. Um, and what I did was, for every variable xi, I made it depend on the variables 1 through i minus 1. See? x2 depends on x1. x3 depends on the previous two. X4 depends on the previous ones. And you define the model to be like this. Um, so you define the model to be a product of this form, of these conditionals. So it, it's known, you can check this, that any distribution can be written in this form. So that means if you choose this to be the base net structure, you will not lose any expressiveness. You will not lose any representation power. Um, so that's good. And this is called an autoregressive model. So finally, we get to the definition of uh, what, what we're talking about in this lecture. This is an autoregressive model. If you take the variables in your problem, and you pick some ordering, and you choose this space in that structure, where each variable depends on all previous variables in the ordering you chose. Yes? D is dimension. Yeah, so generally in these, in these slides, D is dimension. N will be number of data points. All right, so dimension is the same thing as the number of variables. Cool. Okay, so maybe autoregressive models seem intimidating, but we can make them very concrete. We can, we can design and run autoregressive models over two variables. You would never want to do this in practice, but you can do it anyway. And in fact, you'll do it on the homework. And uh, here's how it works. So with two variables, what is an autoregressive model? Here are two random variables. This is an autoregressive model, right? So here, the joint probability, uh, the joint model probability, is p of x1 times p of x2 given x1. That's it. Uh, so that means in order to define this model, you must define a probability distribution over x1 and then a conditional probability distribution. So what would you use for the first thing? Can, can somebody tell me? What would you use? Just personally, I would use a histogram. Uh, it kind of it fits perfectly well here. Right? It's just one variable. Um, we also talked about how to do it. 
So that fits. The second thing is a bit more subtle. Um, this is this needs to be a function that takes an x1, an arbitrary x1, and outputs a probability distribution over x2. So a great recommendation for this is to use a neural network. Um, you can have a neural network that, that is something like a function of x1, and it outputs, what it does is it outputs something like a vector of probabilities. Um, it's probability that x2, or I'll just say p1 through pk, where pi is the probability that x2 is equal to i given x1. Right, you can do this by outputting something from a linear layer than applying a softmax. Right, it's a very standard thing to do. Yes? Yeah. Um, right, so generally, yeah, that's a really good question. Generally, we will work in the case where, um, so first of all, x1 and x2 are all single variables. Uh, yes, yes, they're scalars. So every time, yeah, they're scalars. Um, and we'll work in the setting where each scalar uh, takes on values in a small number of bins. So this is true in images, right? Images are very high-dimensional beasts, but each pixel takes on an integer between 0 and 255. That's really not that much. And the reason that we have um, that histograms don't work is because we have many of them, you know, uh, many of them in sequence, not because any one of them has a lot of, of data involved. Okay, that's an autoregressive model, and you can fit it, right? You can write down the log likelihood, you can take gradients, you're good. Okay, so recall again that the whole reason why we started doing this whole BaseNet business and approximating conditionals is because we want to deal with high dimensions. So in other words, what if we had x3 and x4 up to x to the 780, x of 784 or something like that, is this going to work? Well, this construction by itself won't exactly work because this says for every new data point, let's say x3, at least if you take this too literally, this says that you need to add in another conditional like this. In other words, another neural network that takes in this pair as an input and outputs a distribution over x3. So this seems to run into the same problem. Now the number of parameters grows linearly with the dimension. That's bad. Um, it's still much better than exponential in the dimension in, in the histogram case, in the tabular case, um, but it's still not that great. And uh, I think one fun example is, let's say you want to do text generation. Uh, a sentence might be arbitrarily long. So how long does your BaseNet have to be? I don't know. Um, you could clip it somewhere, but that's not exactly the model that you want to be dealing with. Um, and there's another problem, which is that if you do have separate parameters for each conditional, there's no way to share information between them. We know, like, say, due to the success of, say, convolutional neural, con convolutional neural nets, um, that there is uh, some kind of translation invariance. What you know at one location is the same, what will give you information about what to do at another location. And if you have different parameters for every conditional, then there's no such information sharing between different time steps here. OK, so the solutions to these problems um, are what we're going to talk about next. Um, and this, the solutions will be to share parameters among conditional distributions. Um, and we'll talk about some very clever ideas of how to design neural nets that do just that. OK, I will talk about one of them. It's called using an RNN. Um, again, we're assuming that you know what RNNs are. But an RNN perfectly fits into the mold of an autoregressive model. right? So if you just think of the concept of RNN itself, it actually has nothing to do with probability. It has nothing to do with autoregressive models. It's just some machine that eats up sequences, spits out sequences. But it so perfectly fits into this, because you can have this little RNN machine that eats up the value of x1 and then spits out a conditional probability for x2. Then you can advance it one time step, eating up x2 and spitting out a conditional probability for x3, and so on. And this, this idea has been applied in many, many times um, to 
and a lot of success, especially in text generation. Um, this is just a picture of what it can do um, or what it looks like. Um, I won't describe that further. All right. So now there's the next branch, which uh, Peter will now describe. So these are called the masking-based autoregressive models, and they're super cool. Um, yeah. All right, break time. Ha, <laughs> ha, 
on the board. Maybe we should try to have as much of it as possible. As possible. possible. Or, or, yeah. I did plan to have I wonder if the next time you know, we're looking to see if we can project from iPad. Yeah. Because then we can also annotate on iPad yeah. instead of on the board. Yeah. I think that. Yeah. We need a different kind of plug. Some kind of plug goes from HDMI to iPad. It works for mine. Mine is USB-C. Yeah. Oh, the new iPad is USB-C? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I should get a new one then. Should I try it? But next time I can. Oh, do then it. I'll, I'll get a new one and I'll. Yeah, I'll look into that. Yeah. I think lecturing on that one yeah. is pretty cool. Yeah, so I think you just need to switch Much between. Clearer. You need to switch between the apps. Like, because if we want to play video, then. Oh, can you? I don't think. Actually, you can add it to the see. Oh, but I might not have PowerPoint installed. Yeah. yeah, maybe next time. I, I like that. I like that. We can figure idea. it out, and I think it'll be much cleaner to any, to any kind of annotation. Yeah. Does not have any options? Office compatibility mode? No. I think I need How to. How about annotation? I think I need to. Yeah. No. Next time. So we're trying to see if we could present from iPad and then we can draw on the It'll be much better. Next time. Yeah. 
Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, so let's get back to the lecture. So we had a planned dinner for you guys, but unfortunately we are in the library, so apparently we, it might not make it in. So uh, we will deal with it. So, um, and so Jonathan has talked about uh, how do we structure likelihood-based models, and in particular autoregressive ones that we can train and sample from and do useful things with it. Um, but there are a lot of things that were, like most of the things that were discussed were decades old. Um, in contrast, what we would see in the next half of the lecture uh, would be really new. Like the oldest method of what we are going to talk about is going to be four years old or something like that. And most of the stuff would be like one or two years old. So like all of the things that we are talking about here would be super new, and we will be mostly looking at papers that propose them, um, and look at the fundamental ideas that underpin those papers. Um, so before I start, I want to make a um, uh, uh, make a point about like deep generative model being it's kind of like a hybrid field between statistics or classical machine learning and deep neural nets. So. Okay. Uh, are people hungry? Okay, maybe we should do it then.
guess next time we should form two or three lines.
Maybe with Emily or maybe with Emily. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to know.
So it would be good if people can get back to their seats. We want to mix in some learning into the important eating. So I think the most important thing is how is the pizza? <laughs> Should we discontinue it next week? Yes. Well, yes? <laughs> Who said yes? <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> All right. So uh, coming back to the lecture. Um, so one thing that's really interesting about the type of models that we are going to deal with is that they have a um, very interesting property. So the long-running joke in deep learning is, if something doesn't work, what do you do? Add more layers, exactly. So we will see a lot of examples where adding more layers would not help at all. Um, and that's what, because like, they miss certain statistical dependency. Um, and just by adding more layers, you're not going to fix that. Um, so we're actually looking at a field where, like, call it classical machine learning statistics are not in, like, opposition of deep learning. And these two fields actually work together. Like, you want to um, use your statistic knowledge to design models that exhibit certain properties, and then you design deep neural nets to work with those models. Um, and in most of the models that we will see next, they are basically clever ways to restructure the very popular deep learning primitives that you have in deep supervised learning, and then turn them into models that can be used for generative models, and in this class, mostly deep autoregressive models. Um, so we do assume you have pretty good working knowledge of all supervised, uh, deep supervised learning primitives like multilayer perceptron, convolution, what is a rest net, what is the tension, and things like that. We'll go over that very quickly, but we will assume you have knowledge of those. And we will show you how do you change those into deep autoregressive models. All right, questions before we begin? All right. So um, Jonathan has talked about using RNN as a parameterization of deep autoregressive models. So it's great, like, I mean, if you have a wide enough INN, you're going to get a universal function approximator. And in theory, you can approximate whatever you want. Um, in practice, there are a couple of things that make it not work as well. And one of the property is, uh, if you think about an INN, when you scan through your models in a sequential fashion, um, then it's actually pretty slow to compute all the conditionals. And there's another major class of methods that essentially compute all the conditionals um, in a parallelized fashion. And that is desirable because most of our um, uh, modern compute processor is designed to have good parallelism, but not like high linear speed. So we will try to leverage networks that essentially could utilize more parallelism. 
Um, and these models are essentially different masked version of the classical um, primitives in supervised learning, like multi-layer perception, convolution, and self-attention. So the first thing that we would look at um, is how can we turn a multi-layer perception into a deep net that is an autoregressive model? So um, this is a paper called MATE, uh, Mask Autoencoder for Distribution Estimation. Um, and it's a paper from a couple of years ago. And the core idea of the paper was um, in deep learning a couple of years ago, there's this thing that's very famous called autoencoder, which basically me, with, in which you basically take in the data and then you feed it through some hidden representation and then you need to reconstruct the data again, usually with some um, bottleneck layer or something like that. But then like, we want to ask, like, what is the statistical meaning of this? Like, we learn a function that just reconstruct the input, which is not very sensible in a sense. So uh, what this paper tried to do is they tried to say, uh, how can we actually turn an autoencoder into a thing that can be a distribution estimator, meaning be an autoregressive model that gives likelihood evaluation. Like you feed it any data point x, it tells you what's the likelihood of it, specified by the model. And then you can also sample from it. Um, and the idea and the way that you do it is by masking out certain weights in um, the multi-layer perception weights. Um, so just like any um, autoregressive model, you need to first pick an ordering. So now we have random variable um, x1, x2, x3. So these are three dimensions of the random variable, and they are correlated in some way. So now we pick an ordering. So the ordering that we pick is um, we specify um, x2 as its own marginal distribution, and then we have x3 depends on x2, and then we have x1 depends on x2 and x3. Right? So what, what are we looking at here? What we're looking at here is in the end of the network, we are trying to compute three probabilistic um, distributions. And this is usually specified by three softmax. So think of this one as outputting a bunch of vectors that are the logics, and then you feed through a softmax that gives you this conditional distribution, and similarly for each one of them. Questions so far? Yes. Okay, say that again. So the question is, are all the edges the same? Um, I'm not sure what does the question mean. So <laughs> do you mean the coloring of the edges? Or the... Oh, yeah, so they are, they are coloring they are to denote the dependency. OK, so, so now let, let's focus on uh, x2 first. So we want this distribution to not depend on anything. Right? So you're trying to estimate the marginal distribution of x2. Then say you should not look at x2 because then you will not be estimating the marginal distribution. You would just be reconstructing that data point exactly. Right. So what you want here is you want to mask out the weight matrix in certain way that like none of the x1, x2, x3 would have any edges that point to this node. So that's the core idea. So x2 cannot depend on anything. That's why you see no edges leading to it. And then x3 can depend on x2. So what that means is that um, you can have edges going from x2 to this node. And there could be arbitrarily any number of neurons in the middle of it. But as long as there's no connection um, between, say, x3 and itself or x1 to itself, then that is fine. And for random variable x1, you can depend on x2 and x3. Then that's why you see most edges going to it. So what we have here is kind of like a multi-layer perception, except you're masking out certain weights in your weight matrix to make certain edges go away. Is that clear? And the, re the core reason we do this is so that we could utilize like matrix multiplication that's hyper-optimized for any platform that you want to use. And you can do masking this way and leverage the same uh, um, like optimized kernels, say, on GPUs that people have written. 
Yes. Uh, so the question is, how do you decide in the middle layers like what can have connections to what? So basically, it's arbitrary. So you you specify an arbitrary number of hidden neurons, and then you group them in certain way, and then you say this group can only see random variable x1, and this group can see x1, x2, and this group can see x1, x. Well, it cannot see. It should not see everything. No, it's, it's hand design. So you, you, you by, by design, say certain connections in the multilayer perception are not existent. So that you make sure there's no information leakage. So think of it this way. I'm trying to predict the marginal distribution of x2. Then I should not know a priori what x2 is. It, because if I know it, I don't need to predict it's marginal. I just reconstruct it exactly. So you ba basically, you do masking in a way that prevent information going to the conditional that it's trying to predict. So the numbers on the node here um, is actually super, con it basically means the, um, the conditioning order. So x2 is the first. So for any autoregressive model, we pick an autoregressive ordering. Any one of them would work fine. And for here, we pick x2 to be the first random variable. And then we pick x3 to be the second random variable. Um, and x1 to be the third. Yes? Yeah. Uh, so why is it so good for, you know, for animation? So the question is, why is made or some of his cousins like R made good for uh, anomaly detection? Is that the question? Yeah. So um, that was one of the use cases that was in some of the previous slides. So the, the core idea of all these models is it just gives you probability for any data point. So what that means is that if you feed it a bunch of coid normal events, and then it estimates the probabilities of like what normal events should be. And then you give it an anonymous event, then uh, anomalous event. Then it would essentially say this is a super high, this is a super low likelihood event. Then you should reject it. Um, basically, it says what is common and what is frequently happening. So like you can use MATE to do it, or you can use some other models to do it. You can use INN to do it. So basically, for any distribution estimator, you can turn it into a normal detection model. Those output nodes, um, are they like scalars or are they? Are they, they should be. Um, so, in all of the lecture here, in this lecture, we would be talking about discrete random variable. So, each, like say x2, could take up a bunch of discrete values. And then we would describe that conditional distribution by um, a softmax. So, it would be a bunch of logics. Like, so say x2 could take on two values, then it should be a vector of length two. Uh, I guess is the key idea here that you kind of like the reason you mask is to share the features so across, like along those. Kind of so you actually models. don't you actually don't share features. So each each conditional distribution is somewhat separate. So uh, I know Jonathan talked about parameter sharing. We will see more of that. But in this case, we are mostly just leveraging the fact that um, MapMo is highly optimized, and then you can and this is basically matrix multiplication. And by masking out certain parts of the matrix multiplication, you can get an autoregressive model by using the same compute implementation. Well, why not just have like separate neural networks for each one, as opposed to like masking? Right. So then you like say you would not. So this is a kind of implementation level thing. Like if you can write hyper efficient kernel for it, let's say when you write your neural net, you do not just write in TensorFlow. You write in CUDA. Like if you're that good, then like you don't need to worry about this. this yes. So for CUDA experts, like don't read this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We want to generate a new sample. Um, do you generate one by one? Oh yes, great, great question. So the question is, when do we generate new sample? Like, how are we going to generate it? So we can kind of inspect the auto regressive. Oh, let me do it on here. So when we gen want to generate a new sample, then we want to say, like, let's say I want to get a new x1, x2, x3, this tuple, right? So how are we going to do this? So the way that we do it is, um, well, we can say, can we start from x1? It's not quite possible, because you have not generated x2 and x3. So it does, like this conditional doesn't mean anything. Right. So can you say, can I start with generating x3 first? It's also not possible, because you don't have x2. So actually, the only way you can start is x2, which does not depend on any concrete data point. Right. So the way that you would do it is you would run a forward pass with whatever data you select. 
and then you get this conditional distribution for x2 that is actually a marginal, doesn't depend on anything. So you now get this description of x2, um, which is basically just a histogram. And then you can sample from it. We know how to sample from a histogram. Then you sample from x2. Um, let's say x2 is a binary random variable, have half a chance of 0, half a chance of 1. Then you sample 1. Then what you would do is you would put x2 equals to 1 and then fit it in here. So you would put it down to this node. You would fit it x2 equals 1. And then you do another forward pass. Now this forward pass, what has changed? What has changed is that like for all the, like the light gray color edges um, that end up in this conditional distribution, now this thing becomes specified. Now you can take this as a conditional histogram, and then you can sample from it again. And then you do the same thing for three. So you do forward passes three times, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You 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 are getting ahead of the lecture. So the question is, if if the whole point is to parallelize computation and do it efficiently, then like the sampling scheme that we described like exactly defeats the purpose because like in order to get all three random variables, we need to do three forward passes. So that is actually the essential problem of autoregressive model that we would go see. So what we have look at here is that likelihood evaluation is quick. Like, if I get a certain x1, x2, x3 from nature, and then I want to see what does my model say about it. Like, does my model think this is likely or not? I can just do one forward pass. Because x1, x2, x3 are fully specified. So I can just do one forward pass, and all the conditionals are evaluated in parallel. But sampling is a different matter. Sampling, you would do it sequentially. And it would take uh, linear time in dimension to do it. So it's actually one of the major bottlenecks for this kind of method. Um, and we will see like, some, pro some uh, methods to address it uh, later in the lecture. Cool. Any more questions? All right. So this thing is also like, embarrassingly easy to implement, which is why I have the pseudocode here, which consists of two lines. Uh, basically, like the core of this method is just a matrix multiplication, and then you're just going to mask out the normal like linear weight that you have in some way. And then the way that you can do it is by just creating some mask out patterns that is either upper triangular or lower triangular with the connections that you want to have. So I'm not going to go into details here. But this is just to emphasize that like, once you have a normal neural net, like, turn it into an autoregressive model is super easy, ex at least in this fully connected case. So um, what are we looking at here? So this is the result table pulled from the um, made paper. So what are we looking at here is uh, negative log likelihood test results. So what that means is that I have a model that is trained on a training set. And then now I'm evaluating it on a test set that it has never seen. And then the model should tell me like, how likely it thinks of that um, test data. So if we contrast this with the um, tabular case where we have one entry per data point, um, then we see a big distinction here. Because we notice that the model is not assigning zero probability to data they have not seen. So in fact, it's assigning meaningful probabilities to data they has not seen before. So what that means is that like for this simple um, function approximator applied to, auto, uh, applied to the autoaggressive model, it can, learn, it can have meaningful generalizations. So, oh, I forgot to mention, the data set here is MNIST, which is the same like handwritten digits data set. So you train on a, a set of it, and then it assign non it assign meaningful probability mass to data that I have not seen. So a couple more comments on here. So this is one common way to represent results of likelihood-based generative models, this negative log likelihood results. And usually the units that we call this is called NAT, N-A-T. Um, and that's because we use natural log-based. And then another very common 
uh, ways that you would see paper report results is called bits or bits per dim, which is just changing the um, log e to log two. Yes. I have a question for training like auto regressive models. So when you, so first you, or especially like in this case, like yeah. you pass through it a couple times, yeah. right, to estimate the probabilities. Yeah. What, do you multiply those probabilities together and then do gradient descent? Oh, so, so this basically gives you, oh, good question. So this gives you a bunch of conditional mm -hmm. distribution, right? And then um, because you also know x1, x2, x3, you can plug it into it, and then you get like a log prop of this data point. Mm -hmm. Then you do gradient ascent on that log prop. Yes, that's the same maximum likelihood thing that Jonathan talked about. Cool. Uh, so I was, so I was talking like this are called nets, and then we will also see some bits later. And the reason we sometimes uh, use bits as the unit is because it corresponds to co-length of like how if you need to turn a generative model into a compression algorithm, like what is the expected length to describe uh, the message from that distribution. Um, we'll probably see that more in the next week's lecture. All right. So um, again, this is the same made model that we see um, that's trained on MNIST. And what's shown on the left is samples from the model. So basically, we go through the sampling scheme that we mentioned. Like basically, we sample the leftmost pixel and then, actually it, here it doesn't matter. Like you, you start with any pixel and then you start to sample the rest of it. So like what we see here, each of the image actually goes through 28 times 28 um, function evaluations of your made model to get a sample. So it's not terribly efficient. But we can look at the results. So the results is that um, on the left here is there the model sample. So we can take a look at this one. And then it's kind of like a seven, somewhat reasonable. Um, and what's on the right is the nearest neighbor um, in the data set. And you can see that actually like in the data set there's no such seven that exists whatsoever. Oops. What that means is that like it's able to generate novel samples from a limited set of data that it has seen, um, instead of just memorizing the training data. And going back to the question that um, someone asked for GAN, like do they just memorize training distribution? Um, and it's usually something that's much harder to uh, uh, test in like a GAN-like setting. But in this case, we just need to evaluate its log likelihood on test set to know wh whether it's memorizing or not. All right, so any more questions about MATE, which is how can we turn a fully connected layers into autoregressive? Yes. Is it required that you do binary in this? No, it's, it could, you could do any, any arbitrary um, discrete random variables. In fact, they don't need to be discrete, but for the, sake of complex, uh, for the sake of simplicity for this class, let's treat everything as discrete. So like, say each pixel, it could take up 200 values, whatever. Like, then you just output 200 logits for that conditional distribution, and it's all the same. Cool. More questions about this? All right, so next one. Um, so next thing that we would look at is, um, let's go back to a sequence of data that we have here. So um, the data structure that we work with here would be you have a sequence of something. So that sequence of something could be some natural sequence. Like if you have a sentence, then it's natural to represent it as a sequence of characters. Or it could be a sequence of something else. Like just like the MNIST image that we saw, like you can just tile all the pixels onto a long sequence. Um, and that's a perfectly fine representation. So let's say we have a bunch of data that we want to model that is like this. Um, and how are we going to structure our model? So one, one way that we can structure our model is by using something called 1D convolution or temporal convolution on um, the sequential data. So you basically fit in a sequence of input and then it goes through a bunch of hidden layers and then you have a sequence of outputs. Um, except uh, in this case, well, you know, except like in this case, the input of the sequence is the sequence of random variables that you have. And then the output of the sequence is the conditional distribution. Um, 
is actually a mistake here. This is actually a conditional distribution based on everything before it. So let's call it. All right. So basically, um, what we want the semantics of this model to have is for each of the um, node, output node at location i, I want it to be the conditional distribution of uh, the next location based on all previous things. So we see that there's no information leakage because I'm using all previous nodes to predict the next node. So this is a valid autoregressive ordering and it's a valid autoregressive model. Yes. So the bottom rows could be any, so the question is, is the bottom row uh, pixel in this case, um, it could just be anything. Like you could, I could have a 2D picture, but I, I can tile it onto a 1D. Then I can use this model to fit it. Although no one actually does it, but like you could still do it. Awesome. So how are we going to implement this thing? So one of the cru crucial dependency of this model is that, say, um, this node should never depend on the future. Like, say, this node should never depend on xi. And this is not true for normal tempo convolution because, like, for normal tempo convolution, if you have, like, a um, um, convolution filter of size, filter size 3, then you would have, like, edges, you would have this edge, this edge, as well as this edge. So I'm trying to avoid the black ball because not everyone can see it. Um, so that's, do people have problem with this? Like if you have a 1D convolution with kernel size three, you, you would have another edge here. So which is, oops, which is not good because then this node can influence the conditional of it. And we want to prevent that from happening. And the re there was a very simple way to do it. The way to do it is you just mask out one node just mask out one edge in your convolution filter. So you can have your usual one by three kernel, and then you zero out the last entry. So there's never this edge. And then all the edges that are remain are shown um, in the slides. So now you, have a, now you have turned a temporal convolution into an autoregressive temporal convolution by simply masking out things that depend on the future. Question so far? So what's nice about this is that this is very easy to implement, just like how you saw in the made example. Like you just take your normal temporal convolution layer, mask out a couple entries. Now you're good to go. Um, but what are some of the, and, and it's also very nice. So remember that like convolution share parameters across time in this case then that means like I could have an infinite length sequence. Like my sentence can go infinitely long. And this model would be a perfectly valid, valid well-specified model to handle that. So now I have a model that have constant parameter count, but you can have, it can handle variable length distribution. And it's also very, yes. Ah, yeah. You're getting ahead of the lecture again. So the question is, <laughs> don't you need a bigger kernel to get all the way back? Because that's a very astute observation. So if we look at the conditional distribution of the next node, it actually only depends on very finite amount of context. So we usually call this the receptive field of this node. So what, what you were saying there is the receptive field for this conditional distribution is actually tiny. Like you can actually only look back at five time step, which is nothing. So there, which is actually exactly the last point. Like the, the problem with this naive architecture is that it has very limited receptive field. And in fact, it's linear in number of layers times the kernel size that you choose. So I could choose to work with like kernel size of 10. So it would give you drastic boost, but like not so much that you can handle say length of a thousand um, sequence. So how are we going to do this? Um, so we 
this is a innovation that's introduced in the WaveNet paper and the samples of which you have um, heard an hour ago. And the core idea is that um, in order to improve the limited receptive field, we would use dilated convolution uh, as opposed to normal convolution. How many of you know what dilated convolution is? Okay, almost everyone. Um, so dilated convolution basically means like when you do convolution, um, you don't you don't convolve um, data points that are nearby each other exactly, and the, in fact they are spaced out by a certain thing called dilation rate. So now you can see here it has a dilation rate of two, because it each of the data each of the edge is skip um, skip over one data point. And then the way that you can utilize this is you can increase your dilation rate exponentially so that you could have conditional distribution that actually depends on context that's from far away. And then WaveNet also has some other architectural improvements that make it better. We'll go into that a little bit later. Um, and the thing that um, that's also very interesting here is that even though we have all along we have talked about masked um, convolution mask implementations. Um, actually, at least in this case, like you could actually implement this a lot more efficiently um, than just masking out certain parts of your kernel. So if you think about it, if you mask out certain parts of your kernel, your GPU still does that computation for nothing, like because you know the weight is always by construction zero. So you might as well just not do that computation from the beginning. Um, and the way that you can do it is by essentially, um, so what this means is that if I have a convolution of kernel size k, uh, what I can do is I can pad zeros in front of the sequence by k minus one. Uh, and what that allows me to do is, if you think about the first convolution, like it would basically only depends on the first data point, such that the first conditional that you output, which is for the second data point, which is for the second dimension, um, only depends on the first one. So basically, this is a somewhat clever and not totally trivial way to uh, 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 to implement this kind of autoregressive models that we would actually see again and again. Questions? Yes. Okay, so I need to use this then. So what do we have? We have the x1, x2, x3. And then I want to map them to x2 depends on x1. Um, x3 depends on x1, 2, 2, blah, blah, blah. Right. So, so this is input 1, input 2, input 3, output 1, output 2, output 3, et cetera. Right. So, what do we want to do now is we want to, let's say I pick a um, convolution filter size of two, right? So the way I do it is I kind of convolve, um, um, let's pick something like, so let's say I pick filter size two and then I start converting from the beginning, right? So now this output node would depends on x1 and x2 which is not good, because then you can just exactly reconstruct x2 instead of predicting a meaningful conditional distribution. All right, so we want to prevent this from happening. And the way that you prevent this from happening is you pad some meaningless number in front of it. Let's say I pad zero in front of it. All right. So now I have a, essentially a shifted sequence. So the output of this would be this, 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 right? So I add another entry at the beginning, which allow me to essentially um, shift this sequence one step to the left. And then what you would do is you make the first output not depend on x2. So that's all that is. And then we will see the same idea um, implemented again in 2D um, in pixel CNN's case. Is that cool? All right, so awesome. So now we know how to train autoregressive models on 
1D data using a pretty efficient um, autoregressive convolu uh, 1D convolution implementation. So like, if you like it, you can go train your WaveNet now and then sell it to Google for whatever amount of dollar. Actually, they might not buy it because they already have it. <laughs> um, so what's next? So we have talked about 1D data. Um, that is sequential data. Um, but we are also very interested in images, which is fundamentally 2D. So is it true that you could just flatten your image in whatever way that you want and then turn it into a 1D problem? But that really destroys a lot of the structure. Like We know that fundamentally images are 2D. And then we also want um, the model that we have to have essentially good inductive bias to be able to model images well. So this is becoming a kind of the dark magic part of these models. Like we, we say that convolution networks are translation invariant so that they are good for modeling these things, so which is somewhat true, but not entirely so. Like you can train convolution net to do things that are translation variant. Um, but the core idea is that, like, let's say I have an images, and then I have floating digits in it. So in this case, I have a one that's floating here. And then, but I could also have another image um, where my one is floating at a separate location. So that seems perfectly valid. Like I can imagine this is some restaurant sign and I'm looking at it from different angles, then I would see it at different position. Right. So then essentially we want to find some neural net that is able to leverage the fact that um, a one happening at this location is the same as the one happening at this location. So this is called the translation invariance property. And what we would actually see is that if you use ConfNet that somewhat has this property, you would be able to um, generalize better from limited training samples. So again, this goes back to the point of, like, in all of this model fitting, like, you only get finite amount of samples. And the question is, how much signal can your model extract from that samples? And how much signal can it extract in turn depends on what inductive bias, what structure you give it. And in this case, what we will see is that um, leveraging 2D structure with ConfNet helps you. OK, so how can we have a mask ConfNet to turn it into an autoregressive model and still have it leverage some of the um, spatial structure of ConfNet? So just like any autoregressive model, now we need to pick an ordering. All right, so we have this image, which is uh, high times width times channel dimension. And I need to impose an ordering on that uh, random variable. So a very popular ordering that people use is like the following. So if I want to predict the conditional distribution of this pixel, I would predict, I, would, I can condition this conditional distribution on all the rows before it, as well as, well as um, in the same row, the pixels that are before it. So, seems reasonable. So this is called raster scan ordering. And um, as we know, like any autoregressive ordering works just fine. So different orderings are possible, and we will talk more about that later. But right now, let's say I want to find a confnet that achieves this um, constraint. So what that means is that it's actually more subtle than it seems. So because we pick one conditional as an example. But in fact, like we wanted to infer all conditionals in one forward pass. Meaning I give an image, I fit it through some deep conf net, and then I want this to be a valid conditional distribution. But I also want the pixel app before it to be a conditional distribution of its own. So what that means is that this pixel can depend on everything in the, in the blue, and this pixel can depend on everything before it, but not itself. So basically, you need to find the model architecture in such a way that um, the output of the model obeys that constraint, which is the, essentially the core design challenge in, um, in all models like this. Question? No? So how do we do it? So there's one possibility. The possibility, one possibility is proposed in an um, ICML, actually it was the best paper of that year, 
call Pixel INN and CNN. Uh, and we would only look at the Pixel CNN variant in this lecture. So the way that they propose to do it is, say, I have a convolution filter that is 3 by 3. And then the, what I'm going to do to this filter is I'm going to mask out everything um, from the center onward in the raster scan order. OK, seems reasonable. Um, and if you look at the activation response, what it would achieve is essentially you say the activation at this location would only depends on the activations in blue. Right? So that seems fine, because like now we are not, we are not violating the autoregressive order that we impose. Like it's not looking at itself. It's also not looking into the future. Seems perfectly fine. Um, it has one problem, though. Um, so if you repeatedly apply a convolution filter of this kind of masking, um, there are actually certain parts that it does not see. So to see the problem, like let's think about Let's think of ourselves as being in this pixel location that's being highlighted by cursor. So if we want to compute the next layer of this, then what it can depend on is things around it. right? And you can do this again and again. It would only depend on things around it. So which means this pixel location never makes information from the shadow region. So I can apply the convolution again and again, again and again, and it would never get information access to the shadow region. So that is the core problem, because that means like even though this pixel can mix information from this pixel, but this pixel never gets information of this area. And in fact, you can verify that none of these pixels get information about this area. So what that means is that when I'm trying to compute the conditional distribution of this dark pixel region, there is a certain part of the context that it does not see. So let's say I construct some contrived distribution where this pixel always exactly depends on this location. And it has nothing to do with what's, um, what else in the um, uh, receptive field. Then we end up with a distribution that would never be able to do its job because it does not have information access to the crucial region um, that's relevant for prediction. So this is one area where you could have a pixel CNN that's infinitely deep, and it will still do a bad job by construction. Questions about this? Yes? Is it possible to rotate images? Um, so the question is, is it possible to rotate images? Why do you ask? So the proposal is to rotate images so that we can get rid of the blind spot. But the problem is, in the rotated version, there are blind spots in the rotated version. But if you have multiple iterations. So the question is, can you do multiple iterations to like, kind of sum different models together? I guess it's possible. Like, like you need to structure it in some clever way. Because like, after you rotate it, um, then the same conditional at that, at that like, when you, after you rotate it, they basically obey different autoregressive ordering. And like the information across these two models, if you just merge them together, they would chances are they would violate some autoregressive ordering. Like you would see some pixels that you should not see. But like that might be a way to do it. Yes. So uh, I don't understand the motivation behind enforcing this autoregressive ordering. Uh, it creates a blind spot, and yeah. then you know intuitively, like why is this pixel not going to have anything to do with the pixel that's immediately to its right? So the question is, why, why do we like, go after so much trouble to, to define an autoregressive ordering? So the, the core reason is um, I want to get the conditional distribution of this pixel. And in order to do that, I, um, I need to not know anything about it. Like if I, if I know, let's say the most extreme case, if, it's, if we get conditioned on itself, then like you, you have no entropy to estimate. Like you, it's just a definite number that you are trying to feed through your network. But this goes back to essentially the, the fact that we pick an autoregressive ordering, and um, like each conditional can only depend on certain dimensions. 
And if you break that assumptions, then you no longer have a valid probabilistic model. So um, the whole reason of doing this is to avoid um, or, or very cleverly circumvent the problem of all probabilities, all probabilities sum to one. So you might have alternative ways to structure it, but like autoregressive is one way that we know very well that can do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that's a great question. So the question is like why why do we even bother to do with this 2D convolution thing? Like because we know that in the 1D conv version, like you can throw in some dilation and then make sure it has access to all the context and you will have no blind spot. That is very true. Like but the core question is like let's say um XI is trying to predict um one part of a digit. Right. So let's say I have a digit here. Okay, so this is trying to predict like how does the digit end. Um, then what is also quite possible is that I would have another digit right down here. Okay, so let, let's say we will invest in something that can actually draw on the slides, but for the, for the time being, bear with me. Uh, let's say I have another digit here, right? So if I have two identical digits, one here and one here, then they should, I would argue, they should have similar response in terms of the conditional distribution. Maybe let me, let me try to draw it here. So let's say this is my image. And then I want to predict the conditional distribution of this thing. And I want to predict the conditional distribution of this thing. Right? So I want to predict like, how does the digit one end. So, so basically, um, my argument is if you use a confnet, then the knowledge that you get from this patch is much more likely to transfer to this patch because you're using the same convolution filter applied repeatedly. So basically, you say, um, uh, even though in my training data I have never seen digit one happening at this location, if I test on it, it will probably be fine because it would compute similar activations as the one here. Yes? So, so the, the, the question is, like, this kind of translation invariant can still be done in 1DCOM? Yes. So, like, in fact, like, 1DCOM also has translation invariants. But the problem is, like, the tiling of 2D images onto 1D um, does not perfectly preserve their properties. Like, because, like, let's say I choose a tiling like this. I choose a tiling like this, the same as the raster scan. Um, then what happens is that, like, I would think this pixel is very close to this pixel, which is nonsense, because, like, they are not close to each other in a spatial sense, but they might be close to each other after you flatten it. So maybe you can design a way of 1D structure that still have good inductive bias, but it's usually much easier to just work with um, the 2D structure and use convolution to deal with that. More questions? Yes. So the blind spot problem is the limited receptive field problem, yes. So basically it means in your receptive field, there are certain things that you would never be able to access. But in order to get back the full expressivity of the, of the distribution, you should access it. So it is a like limitation of the... I cannot quite hear you. Oh, so so the question is: Does the um, does the problem go away if you have a larger size kernel? Uh, so not really. You can try it on your own. All right. So. Um, the next paper that we're going to talk about um, introduced a model called gated pixel CNN. We would forget about the gated part for the moment.
But essentially, it introduced a fix to the blind spot problem that we just saw. Um, and the way that you do it is by not using one convolution. Now, think of the model has two streams of convolutions that are happening, and then you would merge information. Um, and then the two streams of conv um, convolution is the following. So one stream, we call it horizontal stack. And what does the horizontal stack try to do is say, again, I want to compute the conditional distribution of this um, dark pixel. Then what I would do is I would have a 1D convolution that is happening in that row that essentially condition on everything before the dark pixel. And that is fairly straightforward. Like we know how to do autoregressive um, 1D convolution. So that's something that we can do. It's just that we would operate a bunch of 1D convolution on this 2D image. It's just like a one, one by X kernel. Uh, so that's easy. And the second part that is not as straightforward is how are we going to get this vertical stack? So what this vertical stack is doing is we try to be able to grow the receptive field in a fully rectangular fashion. So meaning um, as I apply it more, it would grow in this fully rectangle fashion where it do not have the triangle blind spot. Um, by the way, like for a lot of these, like, like none of these things should be immediately intuitive unless you work with convolution all the time. And the best way to make sense of it is just work out one or two examples um, by hand, and then you will see why the receptive grows in certain way. Um, so here's a illustration of how do we do the vertical stack. And the core idea is actually exactly the same as when we use padding to deal with um, 1D autoaggressive convolution. So what do we have here? So what we have here is um, the gray area is the input for the vertical stack convolution. And then the gray area on the right is the output of the vertical stack. And what we want to achieve is that we want to make sure if we flip back, um, let's say I'm at this pixel, I want my vertical stack to be able to access all the information for all the rows above it nothing else. So the way that you can do it is by, again, padding. So this is your original gray area is your original input. In this case, I'm going to pad it by two. So what would that do to it? Then what would it do is that if you look at the first response that it computes, um, so if we look at this pixel, it would be the results of convolving this part. And convolving all padded zero basically gives you nothing. So if you take the first row um, output, like if you take any, um, if you take anything in the first row, it would only depends on zero. It would not depend on anything else, which is exactly what we want. Like if we think about it, if we if this dark pixel is in the first row, then it should not depend on anything. Like the vertical stack should give it zero information. And if you are a pixel that is, say, um, on the second row, then you should, depends on information that's available in the first row. So let's say um, this is the second row's um, response. Then where does this thing come from? This thing comes from convolving this part, which means it can have access to the first row in the input. So basically, for i row in the output, it has, every, it has access to everything in the i minus, um, I minus one and above rows um, in the input. So that's all that it's doing. Okay, this is somewhat confusing. I would give you a minute to look at the visualization. Cool. Yes. Uh, so basically, this is the like so. So after we do this convolution, we would discard everything about uh, everything below the dotted line. Like we would treat this as the output, and this becomes the new first row. This becomes the new second row. Yes. So essentially, when you're doing this, uh, doing this convolution for the part 
like above the pixel yes. of interest, and then take yes. the part that's right next to it, behind, do the horizontal. Yes. Line. Yes. So the it's not a question; it's a comment. So the comment is: Is it what is doing that we have this stream of convolution capturing everything above it, and then we have another convolution capturing everything um, in the same row but before it? Yes. So that's exactly what is happening. So. Again, like for the horizontal stack, we can do the padded 1D conf that we saw. So that's easy. And then for the vertical stack, it's again through padding, but in, um, I guess, in column or row sense. Yes? The question is, do you get left and right most column? Yes, so if you, if you repeat this again, so you see that like this pixel now has access to things next to it. So you apply this many, many times, then this pixel would have information about things on the graph on the right. But the, the trick is you need to apply it many, enough times. Just like in 1D conf, you need to apply it many times for the receptive field to reach a large enough area. So the left most and right most. Yeah. So. Actually, I realized you cannot see any gray area in the projection, <laughs> which, which makes it doubly confusing. Uh, well, OK, so no, no gradient in the slides. Remember that. Um, uh, OK, so like again, like if this is not intuitive to you, like don't, don't feel defeated. Like just walk through an example offline, and you will get it. So, so um, we have talked a lot about how do you do masking, or how do you do patting and shifting in order, for, in order to essentially wrangle the network into an autoregressive ordering state. Um, but that's actually not the complete story. So, also, a big portion of the improvement that came out of last couple of years of generative models is by better architecture. So this is one of the um, building blocks that's introduced in um, gated pixel CNN. So the core idea here is um, instead of just having linear interactions in your activations, now I want to introduce some multiplicative interactions. So what we are looking at here is, like, look at this as a one of your normal convolution block. And then normally, you would just apply a um, nonlinearity and then call it a day. So you might apply 10 h or whatever. Um, and the new thing that's introduced here is this second block. So basically, I have my usual nonlinear um, activation. And then I'm going to gate it by element-wise multiply by another thing that's the same dimension, but between z uh, 0 and 1. So you have another convolution. Think of it as another stream of convolution. And then you would apply sigmoid to it. And then you use that to, um, to modulate the normal activations that you get. Um, so this is a pretty common architecture in, um, in generative models. Like It's not as common in use in other fields, um, but they seem to be able to give much better performance um, at least for a lot of the likelihood-based generative models. So um, what, we, what we are looking at here is um, the results of the gated pixel CNN paper. So the first model that we saw, it's the pixel CNN here. And you can see that it achieves certain results, 3.14. What's the unit here? The unit here is called bits per dim. So basically, you convert your log likelihood into base 2, and then you divide it by the number of dimensions you have. And this is a common way to report uh, uh, um, results of likelihood-based generative models. And you can see that like, um, pixel CNN, due to its uh, limited receptive field, as well as not as much expressive architecture, um, has a worse bit rate than gated pixel CNN, um, which is actually quite a lot better than the original pixel CNN. Cool. 
let's see. So up until now, we have talked a lot about softmax. So essentially, for any um, for any conditional distribution or marginal distribution, we represent it by a bunch of logits that we call like the conditional distribution. So what is what is the problem with it? Like let's say we represent all conditional pixel values with softmax. Like what what are some likely problems? No one? Yes? So the um, the one possibility what you mentioned is like there might be saturation. So, um, so the 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 proposal is like it might not be stable in optimization, but actually this probably the most stable choice that we have. Like this would be a lot more unstable, and it needs a lot more trick to make it work. But <laughs> so usually softmax tends to be the most stable option that we have at least in common architectural design. We have another person that was? OK. Yeah. So the, the, the proposal is vanishing gradient. So like a lot of those things you can deal with by transforming your softmax in a more numerically stable form. Like if you implement it naively, take exponential of everything, then it would explode. But um, in we have stable numerical implementations of most of those operations. Um, so the key thing that um, that is missing by, that is sort of missed by, oh, what's that? I was going to say, like, not all pixels are equally important. Yeah, so the, the this is that's a, also a good point. So like, not all the pixels are equally important. So what that implies is that we had a certain prior knowledge about pixels. Right? So we know that they occur with some patterns. And one pattern that we know very well is like nearby pixels should co-occur more. Like you will not be able to see this red apple. And then if you change the redness a little bit, then it's totally unlikely. Like it's just not a thing. Like if you change the gradient of the redness a little bit, like it's just it should just be equally likely. So but that's a notion that a softmax would fail to capture. Because like, what does a softmax say? A softmax essentially say, out of all these beans, I have no information about them. Like, like pixel value one might be next to bean 1.5. But like these two beans, like in the softmax sense, they are totally permutation invariant. So I don't know any information about nearby signal. So that is one thing that we could actually exploit. So we can say, instead of treating all the pixel values as a bunch of discrete beans, now what I can do is I can um, say that nearby beans should co-occur more often. But how do we do it? Um, so the, this is a trick that's introduced, a paper called, introduced in a paper called Pixel CNN++, and it's actually used in a lot of other places now, including some of the audio generation uh, pipeline in Google. And the um, core idea is the following. So instead of representing our, con yes? Yeah, so, so, so why, don't, why don't we pick an example? Let's, let's say temperature. Let's say I want to look at the temperature of uh, uh, in Berkeley in the last 10 days or whatever. So, right, we have, um, we have temperature here. All right, so I'm going to draw this in Celsius, but. <laughs> Uh, so let's say this is, I don't know, 20, this is 19, this is 18. All right. So let's say I get three data points. So this is the probability mass function. So let's say I get three data points, and two of them fall into 20, and then one of them fall into 18. Um, then I ask you, is it possible that we would have um, a Berkeley temperature of 
19 degree? Is it possible? No? <laughs> Wait. <laughs> yes, <laughs> by this model, no. But by, by common sense, you should experience that, right? I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing that says, like, like, because 19 is so close to 18 and so close to 20, if I see this and I see this, I should say that, like, yeah, I mean, it's quite likely that I would run into uh, a temperature of 19. But however, if you represent this by softmax, you could fit the distribution, and it would fail to capture this. Because you're treating each bean as totally separate entity from each other. Like, they have no connection whatsoever with each other. That totally violates, like, what we know about, oh, actually, 19 is very close to 18 and 20, and it's actually in the middle of it. So what we are talking about here, yes, so that's a um, um, very subtle point. So what we are talking about here is within each conditional distribution. So we have talked, all throughout, we have talked about using a softmax to represent a conditional distribution. And what we're talking about here is within that conditional distribution, we can choose to not use softmax in order to get better generalization. Um, questions? OK, so the way that we do this is we could use a continuous distribution to represent this, um, um, this conditional. So you might be saying, like, are we not saying like we're only, talk, only going to talk about discrete random variable? So yes, so the, um, the random the distribution that we get will still be discrete. But the underlying problem, so essentially we would impose a probability, a continuous um, density function on this. And then we would compute the CDF. Um, so let's say I want to calculate the probability mass that falls into this bin. Then I would simply compute the CDF at this location, and I would compute the CDF at this location, and then subtract that by this location. So then I can know like what is the prescribed probability mass that falls under that bin for my continuous distribution. And then you can choose certain continuous distributions that um, essentially have properties that we like. The one, one of the examples is what we just talked about is nearby pixels should be more likely to co-occur. So the specific choice in this model is called mixture of logistics. And um, the only reason we do mixture of logistics is so that it's very easy to compute is CDF. So a recap of what is the mixture, what is logistic distribution look like? It looks something like a Gaussian, except it has um, not as heavy tails. Um, and then if the CDF looks something like this, and then become, can be computed very efficiently by applying a sigmoid to a kind of location scaling class function. So it's eight o'clock. I think I should stop here and continue next time. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>